Good morning. It is good to be here with you today. I said, my goodness, since I was here the last time, the, the landscape has changed. You really got dumped on, didn't you? Did you get more rain ahead of this snow, or you everything came as snow? You got some rain, too, then. Well, you know, it had been dry, so I guess, you know, God has a way of providing. So, and we just keep knowing that as I came, even, even though it was frozen out there, the birds are singing and the days are longer, spring is coming, we know that. So, good to be here with you, glad that you are here today. And I'm going to allow you to do a lot of reading here on your own, and now I can't even find where I put my bulletin, here it is. You know, we run in, in um, spurts, sometimes there's hardly anything, and the next time our bulletin overfloweth with, with things, and the podium the pulpit overflow with with announcements too so do take a look and um, at all the things that are there a couple of changes providing that we don't get a lot of freezing rain we'll be back here on Tuesday night for a um, Lenten Bible study we did not have one for the past two weeks first of all because of the snow and then I was gone last week to Iowa visiting my mom but we're gonna get back in that routine on Tuesday night but the Thursday Bible study is canceled for this week, if I'm um, reading that correctly. And then, boy, I am curious, a sewing project going on next Saturday and Sunday. So curious as to what that is. Is that a secret? Or is there announcements to share about that? Just, <laughs> all right, good, Zelda. <laughs> You need not know how to sew to come in and be with us as we sew um, a mission project. And I've been handing out little, little things like this. If you haven't gotten any, come see me after church. Um, invite your friends. It'll, it'll be a fun time of sewing, and we'll do something that'll be very meaningful for, um, for women around the world. So um, the little invitation, we'll tell you more about it. We are meeting on Saturday um, from 9 until, until 5, and on Sunday from 1 until 5. <laughs> I think I already goofed. I think Saturday it was from 9 until 4. Okay, and Sunday 1 until 5, and, and then we're going to be meeting our regular Monday hours um, 1 until, until 5. So you need not come all of those times. Come when you can and stay as long as you wish. Um, it'll be a fun time and we'll be doing something that will touch lives around the world. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and I tell you, it will be fun because when this group of women gets together, there's a lot of laughing, a lot of talking. So you need to come. And do they need to bring anything or just their willing heart and hands? All right, so just come prepared to have a good time to, in fellowship and in service as you work on a mission project for others around the world. Thank you for that, Zelda. Um, as I looked here, and I just want to, uh, there's plenty of time to get this announcement in the bulletin, so we'll try to make room for that. But their relay of life has changed, and rather, as I read this, rather than having their um, relay for life walk, they're going to be a um, Communities Against Cancer luncheon, which will be on Sunday, June 3rd, um, from 11 to 1 at the First State Mall in Lemoore. So we'll try to get that in the bulletin, and I'll put this little announcement out on the bulletin board also. And then I do want you to take a look. Not going to spend a lot of time, but we've got a couple of um, informational pages here from the Grainers. And on the bottom, it says, thank you very much, in a handwritten note, thank you very much for your gifts 
of $600 in 2017 for missionary support. So know that your gifts are making a huge difference when we realize she talks here about one of the pastors who pastors two churches and they live on one salary of 200 US dollars a month. Um, which is about 500 US dollars short of what they would need to have even a hint of security and comfort. They are expecting their first baby of this year. So, you know, just wonderful stories here of how God is using people and how they are stepping out in their faith in the midst of uncertainty, trusting that God will provide. So I'm gonna put these also on the, the um, bulletin board, but do know that your gifts are making a difference. So thank you for your contributions for that. Um, just so that you have a little bit of a heads up, um, after we finish greeting one another, we are going to be taking a special offering today and next Sunday for our March mission, which is the Prairie Bible Camp. They are in the process now of rebuilding the dining hall and they saved the kitchen, but they're going to remodel that kitchen. And so you can see from the bulletin there, um, they've already raised 114,000, they need another 22,000. And so our March mission will be to help support that kitchen remodel there at, um, at Prairie Bible Camp, which is the old Lair uh, United Methodist <coughs> Camp. And so then we'll have that ride after we um, greet one another, and then we will have our usual um, regular offering for our gifts and tithes later on in the worship service. So a lot there. Take your bulletin and read it carefully. Are there other announcements that we need to share this morning? Oh, Rick, I got a couple things I wrote down here. Um, tickets are all sold out. You want to go ahead and give that announcement, Rick, for us? Okay, next uh, Saturday, starting at 1.30, Zion Lutheran Church Theater production is going to be presented. Uh, the Saturday is the dress rehearsal. You don't have to have a ticket. You just come and cost $10 to get in. And you get bars, popcorn, juice, and coffee with that. And I understand this year uh, that the, the preacher Hobb, you know, I, I mean, he only has 11 lines. Uh, or. 40 Lines is the real star of the show. So remember that if you come, that uh, it, it is actually uh, Preacher Hobbs, and, and I'm playing Preacher Hobbs, but <laughs> why am I so prejudiced? But, <laughs> they've been putting on this, this op for many, many years, and I can't, I don't know if it's 17 or 18, and it's Cricket County Easter. Oh, okay. So it's a comedy, and it's got a good message behind it. And very popular. Tickets are already sold out, so if you Saturday, don't have a Sunday, ticket, yeah. If you don't uh, have a ticket. Sorry, Sunday and Monday's performance, those tickets are all sold out. So. But you can still get there on Saturday afternoon Correct. without a ticket, just $10, $1.30 for that. And then um, Diane mentioned that there is a musical group from Branson, Missouri called The Sons. They are going to be at the high school in Cullum tonight. She's not sure what time, but um, Gert invited Diane to come on, they were at the manor on Thursday, and Diane said they are excellent. Is that right, Gert? They were an excellent musical group. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> so we need, if you would like to uh, go to that, I'm sure you can find some information or know, track down someone who will know what time that, that musical presentation would be this evening over at the high school in Cullum. Other announcements. I said it was a busy, a busy time coming up here. Do we have birthdays or anniversaries to celebrate? Oh my goodness, look at the people coming up here. Wow. <laughs> coming, your birthday coming up or was it already? Is it coming up? Today. Today, oh my goodness. And y'all, look at you walking there. You are doing well. All right, so Steve, are we birthday, anniversary? Birthday. Birthday, okay. Oh, shh. We won't tell anybody, though, right? No. <laughs> this is for mom's birthday on Fridays. All right. Wow, look at all these birthdays here. <laughs> Happy birthday, everyone. So glad that we can celebrate the gift of life and that your presence here with us in this church family. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. God bless you and keep you. Happy birthday to you. 
and many more, right? <laughs> so glad that you are here to celebrate with us. Let us then come before God um, in prayer on this wonderful day, this day of spring that is coming. Lord, as we gather to worship and praise you on this fifth Sunday in Lent, remind us, remind us that you have shared the most precious gift, our Lord Jesus Christ, with us. Help us to model our lives after his messages of compassion and his service to you and to all your world. We ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. As you are able, let us stand and join in our responsive call to worship. Come with us on this Lenten journey to the temple and then to the cross. The temple is the great house of the Lord. But sometimes our own needs, expectations, selfishness, and fear can even enter the temple. We stand in the need of the presence of God. The Lord has heard our cries and calls us forward on this journey to purify the temple for Christ. Let us open our hearts to the healing. Amen. Our hymn of praise is in your little black, The Faith We Sing, number 2140. Christine, so glad you're here. Thank you. And let us sing together.
heaven. So let us now take time to reach out and greet one another as our sisters and brothers in Christ. I was so busy watching the two, I couldn't get those off. <laughs> God, we give you thanks for those people who have the passion to share their time, their energies, their resources in the camping ministry. And so we give thanks for all the lives that have been touched at what used to be Lair Camp and now Prairie Bible Camp, and for the lives that will continue to be touched there in the camping ministry and in the camps, the other camps we have here in the Dakotas Conference. So God, we offer these gifts to you and pray that you would bless them Use them to continue to share the good news here with those who come to Prairie Bible Camp. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Our scriptures this morning are several short scriptures as I was looking for scriptures that help to illustrate the last message that I'm going to be sharing with you from the, the book Canoeing the Mountains. And so I want to begin with the... Um, the story in Mark, the second chapter, verses 15 through 17. And in these first couple of Bible readings, uh, verses that I will share with you, we are so aware of the fact that 
Jesus was not concerned about what people thought about him, but Jesus was there to serve. And so we read in the second chapter of Mark, and as he sat, being Jesus, as Jesus sat at dinner in Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were also sitting with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And when the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick I have come to call, not the righteous, but the sinners. And then as we uh, move to Luke 13, Verses 10 through 17, again we see that Jesus has um, stirred up contempt as he heals on the Sunday, on the Sabbath. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. And when he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. And so Jesus came to heal and to share what the kingdom of God was like, no matter what the people thought. And then in Matthew 13, verses 44 through 50, these are three really short parables, but I want you to listen, because in each one of these parables, you will find those same words. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, where someone found, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore sat down and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. And so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. On February 11, 1805, a sound rang out through the core of discovery that they had never expected to hear. Not the roar of a grizzly bear, not the thunder of waterfalls, not the call of an unknown bird. No, it was the sound of a baby's cry. The military corps had a new recruit who would go with them from their winter home near Mandan over the Rocky Mountains to the shore of the Pacific and eventually back to America. His name was Jean Baptiste, and his mother would become the most famous member of the party next to Lewis and Clark, because his mother would go with them and become their guide and their interpreter. Lewis and Clark, and Clark called this little baby Pump, as they would nickname him, and he would be the newest member of the Corps of Discovery. Now, Pump's mom, Sacagawea, had been a Shoshone. She was born a Shoshone. She was kidnapped then by the Hidatsa when she was 11 or 12 years old. And she was now 16 or 17 years old 
one of the wives of the French um, trapper um, Charbonneau. La Luz and Clark had hired Charbonneau to be their guide through the mountains, but they very quickly saw the advantage of having the Shoshone woman as an interpreter. By all accounts, we read that it didn't take Lewis and Clark learn to, long to figure out that they had hired the wrong person, that Charbonneau really wasn't of much help, but that it was Sakajawea, Saka and I always get that mixed up because in Iowa I learned it was Sakakawea, and so I'm trying to figure out how he's supposed to say that. They learned that it was really Sakajawea that was of great importance to them. Many times she turned out to be a hero. In fact, a month after she joined the party, Lewis mentions her fortitude and resolution in his journal. Only two months into the journey, Lewis and Clark worried that they were going to lose their interpreter and this valuable member of their party when she became ill with a fever. When a canoe capsized, it was Sacagawea's quick thinking that saved all the captain's journals from going in to the drink. And when the Corps needed horses to cross the Rocky Mountains, they relied on Sacagawea to lead them to the Shoshones and navigate the tent's first encounter, only to learn eventually that they were dealing with her long lost brother. Needless to say then, the horses were procured for the journey and they praised her as their pilot that took them through this expanse of unknown land. Now, if you can imagine a 16-year-old mom with her nursing son on a journey being the pilot of this core of discovery, but the fact of the matter is, is that when you go off of the map, when you enter into uncharted territory, the rules change. All the rules are up for grabs, and there is truly a unique opportunity to examine traditional roles, structures, and dynamics of leadership. Now, it might have been Lewis and Clark's sheer need and fear that they weren't going to survive physically that motivated them to view Sacagawea as their guide and as their pilot. But for whatever reason, as they crossed the Lemmy Pass into the Rocky Mountains, thankfully they were astute enough to know that things were different and that they had to rely on her leadership as much as on themselves. While Lewis and Clark and the other members of the Corps of Discovery were in uncharted territory when they crossed into the Rocky Mountains, for Sacagawea, she was going home, back to the familiar territory that she called home in her younger days. Now, Dave Gibbons, who was a Korean-American church planter who has always kind of lived on the fringes, not been a part of the mainline church, said, the future is already here. It is just on the margins. Survival in uncharted territory comes from unexpected places and unexpected people. Those unexpected places and unexpected people are those on the fringes, on the margin, not in the center of society. Like Sacagawea, they are at home in these difficult and uncertain and troubling times that so unnerve us. But that's how they have lived all of their life. And so they are right at home and very comfortable and able to navigate the things that we in the center are not used to. A kidnapped teenage Shoshone living among the Hidatsin, now one of the wives of a French fur trapper, with a nursing baby at her side. And here she is, guiding the core of discovery, interpreting for them as they are on their journey through the Rocky Mountains on their way to the Pacific Ocean. Now in the Christendom world that you and I have grown up in, where you and I learned how to do church, and where you and I are now the church, the dominant voices were, and in many churches still are, rich, powerful, often educated, unfortunately mostly male, mostly white, from the center or the comfortable middle mainstream. These dominant voices were at home in the modern world marked by stability, predictability, and order. 
But John Martinez writes, and I quote, those of us formed and framed by Western late modernity have tended to believe we can find our way with enough study, focus, and determination. Be it the physical or social sciences, be it politics, economics, theology, or even church planting, we have often understood our task as clarifying, defining, mapping, and doing. But he goes on to say, clearly we are now in a disorienting world, in the midst of situations where cause and effect really don't seem to be connected at all. And because most of our churches were framed in a different era than we now find ourselves, they often seem unable to even understand, much less respond to what is happening. Consequently, as churches, as we have watched our churches get smaller, we have watched them lose influence and power within our larger culture because we see that this is not the place where people gather anymore, this is not the main um, social point in their lives, but that they have all kinds of other things. Because we have seen that happen, sometimes we tend to bemoan and battle and fight to regain that place of dominance. We want to go back to the way it was. We continue to view the world through the same lenses that we're, we were looking through when our churches were formed. We work harder, we work faster to do the same things, defaulting back to our same organizational culture with our same often dejected and burned out leadership. Steve Yamaguchi, who is Dean of Students at Fuller Theological Seminary, makes a comparison between those trained for life in a bishop's palace and those whose ministry has been out in the streets with ordinary, marginalized life. And he says, a church that is bred under the protection of the state is not trained to fend for itself on the streets. So when state and society withdraw their special favor towards the palace-trained church, it gets a very rude awakening. Disorienting and painful can lead to despair, anger, and denial. End of quote. Friends, as much as we hate to admit it and want to be in denial, we are in this rude awakening phase in the post-Christendom era, in a state of despair sometimes and anger. For those who haven't grown up in the church that we have known, the church that was born in this era of Christendom, when all the churches had to do was open their doors and people got, uh, would come. For those who aren't familiar with this culture, but those who are on the fringes, the cultural changes that we are experiencing today aren't nearly as upsetting to them because they are used to them. They have grown up in this time excuse me, this time of uncertainty. These changes to them are no more upsetting than they would be to a mountaineer, and you told him that there was no, uh, that there was a, um, that there were no rivers to run, but a mountain to climb. Because the mountaineer was counting on climbing, not rowing. He was prepared for hiking, not floating. So it's not disorienting at all, like it is for us. As I continued to read, we found out that the vast experience of women, persons of color, leaders from other cultures and religion, um, that for them, the change um, in the Christendom church is as critical as what it was is for um, Lewis and Clark to count on Sacagawea for their survival in the Rocky Mountains. The challenge for those of us that are raised in the privileged Christendom church that had formerly been in the center of culture is that we have to be able to view those on the margins and the fringes as more than mission projects. We have to see them as partners in ministry. We have to see them as those who can train, those who can take the lead, those who have the future strength that we need to make the changes that will bring us out of this challenging and disorienting life that we now live. 
Now, for those of us, many of us in the small towns, I know I was that way in um, Iowa when I grew up. When I went away to college, I had a black roommate. I had hardly seen black people, let alone have a black roommate. And we find that it's pretty homogeneous here in many of our small towns. So we maybe haven't been exposed to a wide range, range of different ethnic cultures, but that doesn't mean that we haven't been exposed to a diversity of people with different educational backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds, different cultural and life experiences. And the problem is, is when we're not exposed to all of these differences, our default mental model creates just one single story. In a TED talk that's been viewed over a million times, novelist Chimamanda Adichie says, the single story then that we are used to because of our limited exposure creates stereotypes. And the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they're incomplete. They make one story become the only story that we see. And it's impossible to engage properly with a place or a person without engaging with all of the stories of that place and of that people. So the consequence of a single story is this. It robs people then of dignity. It makes our recognition of our equal humanity difficult. It emphasizes how we are different rather than how we are similar. Our associate professor at the Duke Divinity School, Christina Cleveland, says, people can meet God within their cultural context, but in order to follow God, they must cross over into other cultures because that's what Jesus did when he walked this earth. And that's what he did on the cross. Discipleship is cross-cultural. As disciples of Christ, and especially during this season of Lent, as we follow Jesus to the cross, we must look at the marginalized, those that are on the edges and the fringes of our society that Christ associated with, those that we read about today in our um, scripture lessons. It didn't matter that Jesus drew contempt when he ate with the tax collectors and sinners, even calling a tax collector as one of his disciples. And how dare he heal a woman on the Sabbath who had been bent over and disfigured and crippled for 18 years. While Jesus often performed miracles of healing in his ministry though, as we read about in those parables, the purpose of Jesus' ministry was to proclaim and to demonstrate the good news. And in this process of demonstrating the good news, he often made those that were in the comfortable center very uncomfortable. And he challenged the culture of the day that excluded those on the fringes. As I said, hopefully you notice that all three of those parables began with the kingdom of heaven is life. And not only were those three parables, but there were other parables that also said those very same words. The kingdom of heaven in an earlier reading in Matthew could be compared to someone who sowed good seed in the field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. Or it can be compared, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a mustard seed. And we probably remember the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Jesus' purpose in coming was to show us how to cross the lines of culture, how to reach out to those on the fringes, those on the margin. And so being a disciple of Christ, being the body of Christ that we are called to be today, is not about making ourselves or others comfortable. It's about bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth right here, right now. And that means then that we will be mingling with those on the fringes, learning together with them as we work to expand to have a more complete picture 
of heaven on earth. To be the missional church, to live Jesus' gospel in our own world, requires that we must listen deeply and broadly to all the voices in a geographic area. Sacagawea's voice was critical as both translator and guide to the core of discovery. As the church today, we need to be sure that we are listening to those voices on the fringe and the margins that are right here within our geographical setting. As I said, while there may not be many voices of color or different voices of nationalities, there are certainly different voices of educational backgrounds, different opportunities and experiences in life, different socioeconomic backgrounds, and then there are those who have no church or those we have referred to as the Duns, who are just finished with church in our community. But we've got to do more than just listen to them. We have to engage them. We have to partner with them, allowing them to lead, allowing them to teach us from their experiences of being home outside of the walls of this church, out on the fringes and the margins where life is challenging and disorienting. Nine months after uh, Sacagawea's baby was born, in November of 1805, after traversing 340 miles over land, and this just blows me away, 140 of those miles through rugged mountains and 60 of those miles through the snow, the core of discovery and Sacagawea reached the Pacific coast in what is now the, or the state of Oregon, and the rainy, cold winter was ahead of them. Lewis wanted to build their winter camp closer to shore, and Clark wanted to make it further upstream. Unable to decide between themselves, the two captains gathered the Corps for a vote. Now imagine this, a vote in a military unit? And here's what's even more surprising. Not only did every man that was in the Corps of Discovery get to vote, but Clark's slave York, his black slave, got to vote, and so did Sacagawea have a vote. Talk about history making and seizing the opportunity to do things differently, throwing out all of the norms, all of the ways that we have looked at things in the past, looking at things through new lenses, taking advantage of new ways because they were in uncharted territory. Lewis and Clark were taking advantage of all the different perspectives they had around them. They were hearing more voices to make the picture more complete. And the voices that they were hearing through York and through Sacagawea were not the voices in the center, but they were the voices on the margin, the voices on the fringe. It's fitting that we should conclude our series on canoeing the mountains during this time of Lent, when we ourselves are called to deny ourselves and follow Christ. I don't know about you if you found anything challenging as I've shared from this book, but I have gone back and reread parts of it over and over as I have puzzled about what to share that's in all of this. For me, the church that I grew up in, the church that you grew up in, as we sit here with empty pews around us, we can see that it's no longer the center of our community and of our Western culture. We find ourselves in decline and we don't know how to stem the tide. The reality is, is that it's time for us to change. It's time for us to go off of the map into the unknown, to die to what we have known, die to our own, un, our own comfortableness, and be willing to engage and embrace and listen and learn from those that are on the fringes, but those that are at home there in the midst of the uncertainty. Todd summarized his book with the bullet points that you see in your bulletin insert, and I know Mark was putting those in and distributing those to you. And so take some time to look at those, and I'm sure there will be some things there that hopefully you'll remember that we talked about, but some things there that may challenge you and say, oh, this is a little unsettling to me, this is a little uncomfortable. But Todd summarizes and says what all of this, through all of this that we've heard, 
Focus on your own transformation together. First on you as an individual, and then as you are transformed, how your church will be transformed. He said, focus on the changes, not on the church dying. Focus on the mountains ahead, not the rivers behind you. And focus on continually learning um, more new things, not on what you have already mastered. The words of Antonio Machado sum it up aptly. Wanderer, there is no road. The road is made by walking. And so God calls us to journey with God, trusting that God will guide us as we walk together, forging the road into the unknown, into uncharted territory. If you would take your um, insert out and on the back of it, you will find there in bold a prayer. And let us join together. Let us pray together that prayer that's on the back, on the bottom, in bold. Have you found it there? Let us pray together. Holy and loving God, you are a God of constancy and yet a God of change. Throughout the ages past, still today, and into the future, you continue to love us, forgive us, seek us, and call us. And yet your ways of call are constantly changing, miraculous and surprising, including the flood, the burning bush, perfect stillness and calm, healing miracles, and the rolling away of the stone at Jesus' tomb. Holy God, thank you for who you are for your love, for your forgiveness, and for your constant call in our lives, both individually and as your body. Convict us and help us listen intently for your call. Breathe into us the desire, the willingness, the courage, the determination, and the stamina to follow you to become your mission church going outside our four walls, crossing the separation and divisiveness, and off the map into uncharted, uncomfortable territory to partner with those who are already home to proclaim your kingdom in this world, here and now. Help us to turn loose, deal with our loss and fears, and rely solely on you, our Creator, Redeemer and Sustainer. We ask all of this in your holy name. Amen. Our hymn of dedication then is Open My Eyes That I May See on 454 in our hymn. 454.
other concerns to lift up at this time. I do want to share with you, um, Marguerite called Diane yesterday and said that Pastor Dick Ankenholz is in the hospital. He's on oxygen, not doing well, and so um, if we could um, add Dick to our prayers, Dick Ankenholz, and um, Lorena has made her decision. I know she, Lorena, um, had some tough decisions to make, whether she should continue on with some chemotherapy, if that would reduce her chances of cancer returning, and Carol tells me she is now. Has she started those treatments already, Carol? She starts on Tuesday. So we give thanks that she came through the surgery, that she's been able to return to work. But now we pray for her as she goes through the, the chemotherapy that she will be receiving. Are there other concerns or joys to lift up? Let us take a time of silent prayer then that I will lead us in the pastoral prayer and we will pray together the Lord's Prayer. The days are getting longer, Lord. The sun's rays are higher in the sky, bringing more light to our world. Warmth begins to flood over the snow-covered, frozen ground. Holy God, may the warmth of your mercy and love pour over us. As we have gathered this day to celebrate the good news that you have given to the world, remind us that it is our purpose to offer that good news to others, to show them to model for them, to live for them what the kingdom of God is like, and to invite them into that kingdom of God to be in ministry with us. God, not only in words are we to talk and to pray about the kingdom of God, but we are to be the hands and feet that usher it in. As we have offered names of people and situations which have been heavy on our hearts, for your healing mercies. Remind us also, God, that we stand in need of that same healing love. Allow us to humble ourselves, to come before you, and to ask for you to take away those things that burden us, those things that need healing in our lives. As we have prayed for ministries of peace and justice, and for those engaged in those wondrous ministries and missions, remind us that we are also on a journey of peace and justice whenever we offer comfort and aid to others. Be with us during this Lenten season. Give, a, give us hearts of great joy and courage to serve you in all of our days. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Our prayer response, in his time, in the faith we sing, 2203, let's do one verse, let's do the first verse, in his time.
gifts from our hands, but may they be an expression of our praise from our hearts and proof of gratitude from our minds. The ushers will wait upon us now for our gifts and our time. Thank you. 